so the other the other party is are they going to address us tonight or are they going to just deal through you which is fine with me i just I, want to understand what's going here on prepared to address you yeah Bob, you want to hear from the yes. now? Let's get this part yeah, over with. Go ahead. Uh, Mr. Yeah. Chairman, I'm Paul Jensen. I'm here with um, Diane Combs, who is the who this space was created at her request, and I think the board's very familiar with this. It's been before you twice. It's a handicapped space right opposite her gate, which is a way for her to get in and out. Uh, she needs assistance to get in and out, and she uses it. She understands it's a public space, but it's very important that it's there. And last winter we had a lot of snow, so it had to be shoveled. It's about 10 feet from that space to her gate, and if we move it up, it'll be about a little over 20 feet, a little more shoveling. Fayette Street does not get plowed usually, so whoever picks her up has to park, shovel in, go get her, bring her out for her planning board meeting or for HDC. And it's very important this space is, keeps her so she isn't trapped in her home. Now, we did... I know the applicant has had discussions with my clients, but nothing has ever come. I don't think any great offers were ever made. Today we had a very fruitful discussion. Historically, these spaces were on the other side of the street. We'd love to move the spaces back on the other side of the street um, because then the handicapped spot would be closer. Um, there'd be no loss of spots. This would solve all the problems. And what I would request this board do is to table this, let us go back to traffic safety and get approval to move the parking across, and then everybody can support it. Um, in terms of building permits, I just saw a plan that shows a bunch of curb cuts. I think they could probably use those curb cuts to finish off their thing and then revise them to this plan later. Um, I don't think there's any real hurry that has to be done right here if they're not going to start work till June of next year. Questions? I guess off off the no questions, Bobby. I'm good. For, I think I'm good for now. Can I just a couple of points? Yep. If I might. Um, first, I just want to point out that the change, even though the space is moving horizontally about 20 feet, the actual distance, because it, if you go on an angle to the gate, or actually there's another gate that's directly across the street from this particular new space is somewhat less than, it's just shy of 10 feet. Um, we measured that today, so it's a, it's a 10 foot difference. Um, the other thing is we do need the curb cut now. We can't get the curb cuts for that other um, iteration because it would require us to go back and redo all of our permitting. So if we're gonna go back and redo all the permitting, then the ship really has sailed and we'll just continue down that particular path how do you um, feel about the parking on the opposite, opposite side of the street? We, we are happy to support it, absolutely happy to support it. So, you know, in my mind, it seems like, you know, there's, and I know um, Mr. Sanford and Mrs. Alger are very aware that the board feels very strongly about these handicapped parking spaces. And at the same time, it seems like there'll be a bit of delay before construction, and even during construction, you know, the driveway is going to be the last thing built. So it seems like... I don't see a big conflict here, so in my mind, I think we could pass this. And if there's any problem over, you know, between here and now and June 16, and um, Mr. Jensen comes to us and says, um, you know, there's no handicapped space and um, it's been moved too far, um, or, or that it's inappropriate, I think the board could hear at that time, or hopefully before that happens. And I hope the client. This building would understand that, and and maybe in the once the traffic study is done, we can move the traffic over to the other side of the street, and we'll be all. It'll be even better for the person using the handicapped space. That seems all in order for me. I don't know exactly how to express that in a motion, but that's kind of what I'm feeling. Well, it sounds like you're asking for a technical approval. A technical well, approval, and so I think that's the first step. And the understanding is that we'll work towards the alternative. Everybody's operating in good faith, and if good faith doesn't work out, we'll, we may have to be back well, at what's, this at some point. My question is, what's the process to move the parking to the other side of the street? 
Do we have to have a public hearing? No. If you want traffic safety to recommend it, go ahead. If you want to do it right now, go ahead. So we could do it without traffic safety? We no. could. Traffic safety is just an advisory group. Right. But it's not, but they might ask questions. I mean, there might be some issues might we don't think of tonight. So I don't think it hurts to wait a couple of weeks to let them consider the... Oh, I'm just yeah, spitballing know? here, but if the first three houses on either side of the street don't mind the parking moved over, what's, what's the big deal to put the no parking signs on one side and move the parking to the other? Yeah. It's the same, the same three houses use them. It's right. like, you know, we call this a public parking space but it was really it's really Diane's space I mean that's the reality of it I mean not it's not like somebody down the street who's handicapped is going to park there we could move the parking over in the first half of Fayette Street because I don't think there's parking on the north side of the Fayette anyway is there mm -hmm. or is I, there I don't no. think so no right so we're only talking about this one section yeah we just move the no parking signs from one side to the other and then the curb cut and go in and Diane's closer to the house and everybody wins seems like great let's do it Somebody make the motion. I'll make the motion to move. Now, help me out with the streets, or from the from the points, from the edge of the town parking lot to Union Street. We'll switch the parking from the north side, the north side to the south, the south side. side. And we'll move the handicapped space across the street is in the same place it is now. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? <laughs> Aye. Aye. Sure. Aye. There we Aye. go might have to slide a little bit so that when the cars come out it's not coming directly at the space. But it'll still be closer for Diane so yeah. if it slides a little bit up the street it'll be closer. You won't have to cross the street now. You can get out and get right into your house. So. Correct. Sounds like a win-win. We'll, we'll, we could grant it anyways. Just well we may have to put a yellow stripe across the street so technically we're still eliminating a parking space because they'll have to come out. Right. So we're right. still limited. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. all right. So there's been a motion as made, second. Yeah. Yeah. All right. And and I might add in, um, I'm supporting this because there's an a, an additional public parking. It's not as though the no, current actually eliminates public parking because I think there's been a couple instances in the past where we've allowed private individuals to have a curb cut and that's eliminated parking public parking and I I don't think that's right and in this instance it's increasing public parking you know someone might say well this is we're we're gonna have a curb cut but we're gonna have five off-street spaces in this instance I think it's really important to understand that we're still providing the public at large these are the town spaces and everybody has the equal right to use them and we're continuing that process forward i just wanted to make a note as you're gaining a space on union yeah. i i just I, I like the design with the single curb cut rather than three i think that's a positive uh and i'll give you the negative it just, it's it's sort of sad to see the yards downtown turned into parking lots i just think that's a a bad trend and we're under more pressure and we're seeing more and more of it this is a pretty good design but it's because we haven't taken care of the downtown parking, people have had to turn their beautiful yards into, you know, into parking yards, and I just think that's a sad state. But that's and, right. And if I could make one more point, if we could ask um, that the, if there's going to be a sidewalk on that side of the street on Fayette Street, if we could ask, there's no sidewalk. There's no sidewalk. Yeah. Okay. Just wanted to double. I wasn't sure if there was a section of it that. Okay, thank all right, you. So we're all good there. Okay. Motion was made, seconded, and approved. Okay. Yeah, I we, did. we did. Five yeah. all. <clears throat> all right. The next item is request for approval to change of manager for the annual all alcohol beverages re restaurant license for Sea Dog Nantucket LLC DBA Nick's Brew Pub from James Ag New Manager to Richard De Russia. Is that right? Did I pronounce that right? Hopefully, for premises located at 15 South Water Street. Yes, sir. Mr. Swain. Hi, uh, Brian Swain, attorney for Nick's Brew Pub. Um, here on behalf of Nick's, if you have any questions. Uh, I just have one. Is um, Mr. It, is it DeRussia? Did I pronounce that right? DeRussia, yes. Is he actually employed at the restaurant? He's on premises? He is. He is. He's uh, filled out his Corey application, been fingerprinted, application's complete. All right. Questions from the board? Fairly routine. Motion to approve. Second. 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 All those in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.
Thank you. You're all set. Thank you. All right, we're going to um, switch this order and uh, do selections, reports, and comments before we do town manager's report because we have we may have um, some witnesses here that are need to go. So I have a whole process here I have to go through. Um, I'll call these hearings to order. This is uh, hearings regarding sanctions against the following establishments resulting in liquor license violations pursuant to the Town of Nantucket Rules and Regulations Governing Alcohol Beverages Section 15, Sanctions for Violations of Regulations against Arno's Figs, 29 Fair Street, Islander Package Store, Murray's Beverage Store, Sconset Bookstore, Table One, and the BFW. Uh, anyone who's going to speak on these items um, needs to stand up now so that I can swear you in. That n so lawyers, owners, managers. And as, as they're getting ready, I'm going to, I have three customers and one may be here, so I'm going to abstain again, unfortunately. Okay, do you all swear to tell the truth as it pertains to these issues? Oh, right hand, raise your right hand, I'm sorry. Do you all swear to tell the truth as it pertains to these issues? Okay. All right. Uh, um, yeah, can you all stand up? Again, please, and give Erica your names one at a time. Let's start at the front. Mr. Gullickson, do we need that? No, you don't really need that. We don't need it, Chief? Chief you, saying you we don't. Ask, you ask them to, to stand up. If they didn't, there's no penalty. Okay, so okay we're good. Deal. All right, sit back down. I'm sorry. you got to work with me here. This is the first time I've done this. So, All right, the uh, complaining officer at the town, that would be the chief, is going to give us <coughs> – we're going to start with um, – Arnos, Chief? We'll start with Arnos. Okay. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the Board of Selectmen. Um, let me preface the discussion, first of all, um, with a review of why we're here for the record. Um, the town uh, had asked the police department to uh, conduct uh, investigations into the operations of the licensed establishments over the years, and uh, as part of that, we do uh, – compliance checks to determine if um, underage persons are being served in some of these establishments. Uh, when we do these investigations, we follow a procedure that is outlined by the um, Alcohol Beverage, ABCC, the Alcohol Beverages Commission, whatever, um, from the state. They provide a uh, checklist of things for us to follow. Um, I have some documents that we'll be able to enter into the record. Um, here so that we have a complete file on uh, these investigations. Uh, one of the first things that's required is that the uh, town provide notice um, through the local press <coughs> that uh, we intend to conduct these um, types of investigations. On July 14, 2015, the police department issued a press release announcing our intention to conduct these investigations. That press release was followed up with a discussion uh, with the local newspaper, the Inquirer and Mirror, um, and they published an article about it on July 23rd. However, they also published the article on their website page on July 14th. Um, the Nantucket Police Department also published via our uh, Facebook page um, our intention to conduct these investigations on July 15th. Uh, and WT... WXTK Radio published both on their website and verbally on their radio um, on uh, uh, July 17th uh, the intention of the police department to conduct these investigations. So we believe the requirement to provide an adequate notice to the licensed establishments has been met. So I have that document. Um, the second thing is what we did, the procedure for conducting these investigations is for plainclothes detectives at the direction of the chief of police to conduct the investigations using um, under, undercover operatives, um, underage operatives, excuse me. And uh, we used employees of the police department um, that were employed in seasonal positions that were all underage. As part of that uh, 
file we have the records for each department or each uh, uh, licensee we have a photograph of the underage operative and we have a um, copy of the breath test that we gave the operative before and after the investigations were completed so to document in compliance with the ABCC guidelines so each file has a picture of the operative as they were dressed that day that they conducted the investigation or the, the operative. So with all that said, set the stage. Um, the next uh, first one that we have is Arno's. Um, this particular establishment uh, following completion of the investigation Nantucket Police Department believes the enough cause exists to refer Joseph V. Arno, the licensee, which holds an all-alcoholic beverage license issued pursuance to Mass General Law Chapter 138, Section 12, to the Board of Selectmen for violation of the following um, rules, regulations, or Mass General Laws. Uh, in particular, one count of violation of Mass General Law Chapter 138, Section 34, which is sale or delivery of an alcoholic beverage to a person under 21 years of age. The facts of the case are, as I stated earlier, Chapter 250 of the Town Code provides the authority for the police department to conduct these investigations. And on Tuesday, July 21st, July 21st 2015, at approximately 6.30, 6.31 p.m., Detective Whiting and Detective Cook conducted an investigation of the business operation of Joseph V. Arno, doing business as Arnold's Breakfast and Seafood Restaurant holding current license number 0762-00205. Two underage operatives working with the detectives purchased alcoholic beverages, a Stella Artois beer and a Samuel Adams summer beer for $19.15 in cash. The underage operatives, aged 19 and 20, were not asked for identification. Lisa Newville was identified by detectives as the person who sold the alcoholic beverage to the undercover operatives. The history with that establishment um, has violations in 2011, 2012, 2013, and 2014. In 2011 and 2012, the department handled the disposition of those violations by filing um, charges in the district court against the bartenders for violation for selling the underage um, uh, operative. In 2013, they sold, they had one count in which the establishment agreed to and served a three day suspension of their license that they um, served April 9th through the 11th, 2014. And then in 2014, they had another violation in which they again agreed to serve a three-day suspension, which was served December 9th through the 11th, 2014. Both of those um, suspensions were um, agreed to by the license holder and approved by the Board of Selectmen. In this particular case, there are several aggravating factors. Um, first of all, Newville, the bartender, did not provide or was unable to provide any proof that she had a valid server training certificate, no tips training. Um, they made multiple sales to an undercover purchase on the same occasion. In other words, they sold to both of the, of the operatives without asking for IDs. Um, and the staff was certainly not suitably trained. The Blue Book Guidelines, Chapter 250, Section G of the Town Code, recommends a 7 to 15 day suspension for this particular um, offense. Um, now, I've made a modification after talking with Town Council to the Department's recommendation on this particular one. Um, we are recommending a 15-day suspension with seven days to be served July 17th through the 23rd, 2016, which is a Sunday through Saturday, with seven days to be held in abeyance for two years, provided no further violation of Chapter 138 or Chapter 250 occurs. I'm available for any questions if you have any. Any questions for the Chief? Just that one. Just that last part, Chief. So they'd serve a, a suspension for seven days, and then they wouldn't have to serve that second seven days if there was no further violations. That's correct. If, if in the next two years they had another violation, they would have to serve that second seven days. The ABCC uses this in a lot of their um, decisions and penalties. They feel 
um, after talking to the ABCC investigator, they feel that's a strong incentive for establishments to stop violating and clean up their act. Because if they do have another violation, they'd face an additional suspension for that violation plus the seven days that have been held in abeyance. Any other questions? Do you want to act on these as we go through them, Bobby? No, we have, there's a process here. Is there a process? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, Mr. Gullickson, you're representing Arnos? Yes. Go ahead. Kenneth Gullickson representing Joseph Arno, who's present tonight. Um, I don't want to in any way minimize this um, or suggest that he's not taking responsibility for this or that it hasn't happened before. Uh, he has undertaken procedures to try to ensure that it does not happen again. The main thing that I want to point out to the board is that the report of the chief I think is misleading in that prior to partially through 2012 the property was leased to a tenant and Mr. Arno had no involvement whatsoever with the operation of the restaurant. It wasn't just a case of change of manager, it was a completely different business operated by an entity that he was the landlord of. So he has, I don't see why 2011 should even be mentioned tonight. So we take that out, um, I think the record looks a lot better. Again, it's, it's not stellar, he admits that. Um, we're not saying he's clean. Um, I just want to point out again that it's not as bad as it looks. Um, he was willing to accept uh, a suspension. I think 15 or 14 days is a bit excessive given um, that history uh, and would ask the board for a six or seven day suspension in light of um, the fewer offenses than what has been reported. Any questions from Mr. Gunkson? No. Mm -hmm. Chief, do you, um, you both get to have closing statements? Well, I, I can just, uh, I'm aware of uh, the situation that Mr. Uh, um, Gullickson mentions about 2011. However, we did a search back in the records um, of the establishment, and clearly the two incidents that resulted in the three-day suspensions each occurred well under the authority of uh, Mr. Arno. But the records the town has on this liquor license indicates that uh, Mr. Arnold still had an interest in that liquor license. Um, he, he wasn't running the establishment, but he still had an interest in it. Um, so, you know, it's, it's not that he was totally divorced in 2011 from the goings on in there. Could I just respond to that? Yes. Uh, when you, if you're familiar with the application process, you have to report who has a financial interest in the license. As a landlord with a lease that had a percentage possibility based on the percentage of sales, he could have received some money as a result of liquor sales. That is his involvement as a possible financial rent payment based upon sales. It's a percentage lease. He had no involvement in the management or operation. Um, he was strictly the landlord. So technically under state law, he has a financial interest in the license, or had at that time financial interest in the license of the tenant, but he had no control or authority over the license or the operation of the premises. Any other questions? All right, I'm going to close the hearing. So the first thing we need to do is decide if there is cause here for this violation. Seems to me. Seems pretty clear, Bobby. Right. So I think there's sufficient cause, yes. I move that the board find that. What's the, is the date right on this, Chief? Or what, on September 1, <coughs> is that what I'm supposed to? Or is it tonight's date, right? Or is it on the date of the actual violation? The date of the actual violation. Which was? Yeah. Uh, July 21st, 2015. I move that the board find that on July 21st, 2015, the license violated, the licensee violated General Law 138, Section 34, by serving alcohol to a minor. And I move that the board of select and find that on July 23rd, 2015, the licensee violated Chapter 250, Section 16, Eight of the board's regulations by allowing patrons to remove no that's they didn't remove drinks in the premises that's that's a different one no okay this is simply just, just the first one just the yeah. first one so strike the second one Erica so, so it's I move that the board find that on 
the date. The licensee violated chap, uh, Master General Law 138, Section 34, by serving alcohol to a minor. I second that. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All, right. All right. Now it's up to us to <coughs> deliberate, and you're all free to make a motion as to what the suspension should, what the punishment should be. Comments? Questions? You know, I guess off the bat, you know, it seems as though um, the uh, the entity that made the violation um, indicated that seven days was appropriate. I know th from the recommendation of our police chief, he had this concept about seven days and then seven days, you know, um, again, if there is a further violation. Um, to me, that seems in accord. So seven days from July 17th through 23rd or we could just stick with the seven days. If there's another violation in the future, we can deal with that. Well, then. I, I think we could. Uh, I, mean, I like your original motion, which I think was to adopt the recommendation of the police department for a seven-day suspension serving in 19, 2016, and that it would the seven the second seven days would be uh, there, but he could earn his way out if he's clean for two years. Mm -hmm. So. I don't have. I don't see the chart here from before. If we removed the 2011 violation, what would the penalty be? What's the recommendation? I'm just not. I'm not seeing that chart that we had in here last time. Yeah, I know we did have it on the last one. It was. There's still five violations because there's one, one in 2012, one in 2013, one in 2014, you. and then two in 2015. Because yeah. one is for the alcohol server and one was not being tips certified. Yeah. So I think you total. knock out 11. You still have a pretty clear, uh, unfortunate, clear okay. record. <laughs> so I'd make a, a second to Mr. Atherton's uh, motion or? All right. So. And uh, the seven-day suspension to be uh, held in abeyance if he uh, does not have any offenses during the next two years is the way I think I heard the recommendation. Mm -hmm. So, twenty. Mentioned. So, the tw through the 2016 and 2017 season. Right. Or and just to just period. to clarify, when would that abeyance? You know, if that if there was a further violation, that abeyance would take effect. You know, July. Does it automatically kick in, Chief? Or does it have to, we have to go through the hearing process no, again? No, there's no hearing process. It would take effect starting the, uh, at, from the, you could say either from the date of the finding, which would be today, or from the date of the first suspension for the next two years. You can say which, whichever you prefer it to be. I, I so uh, it, generally, I would think that if their suspension date is um, going to be uh, July 17th through the 23rd, I would say the next two years from that from date. From the 23rd on. Yeah. I think that's a good addition to the motion. So that's your motion. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. First one's down. Next one, Chief, is... Next one, and I did, um, again, the same uh, intro to those. The next one's going to be uh, Figs at 29 Fair Street. Mm -hmm. um, just one little comment uh, I want to add in here. Uh, in July, in June, we gave a seminar, many of you recall, there was some controversy about it, to the license holders, but one interesting note was out of the seven here tonight, only six of them registered, I mean, only one of them registered to attend that, conf that uh, seminar, six of them were not there, or if they were there, they didn't register who they were representing. Um, but 29 Fig Street, or 29 Fair Street, which is Figs, um, violation, uh, occurred after an investigation uh, the department believes that enough cause exists to refer 1709 associates LLC doing business as figs at 29 fair the licensee which holds a wine and malt beverage seasonal alcohol license issued pursuant to mass general law chapter 138 section 12 to the board of selectmen for violation of the following town and Nantucket rules and or mass general laws one count of uh, <coughs> violating Mass General Law Chapter 138, Section 34, sale or delivery of alcoholic beverage to a person under 21 years of age, 
and ma a violation of Mass General Law Chapter 138, Section 26, operating without an approved license manager, and um, the, uh, the relevant local or er, thing there. The facts of this case are, again, the department has authority to investigate these types of, of violations. And on Wednesday, July 22nd, 2015, at approximately 8.55 p.m., Detective Whiting and Detective Morneau conducted an investigation of the business operation of 1709 Associates, LLC, doing business as FIGS at 29 Fair. An underage operative working with the detectives purchased an alcoholic beverage, a glass of Prosecco La Marca, for $10 in cash. The underage operative, age 20, was not asked for identification. Robert Coles was identified as the bartender who sold the alcoholic beverage to the undercover operatives, and he's also identified himself as the licensed manager. On August 11, 2015, at 2 p.m., Lieutenant Adams had a conversation with Danielle D. Benedictus, an attorney and possible co-owner of the licensed premises, in regard to the restaurant's liquor license where she stated that Tracy Root was no longer the manager. Tracy Root left a message on Lieutenant Adams' voicemail on Monday, August 31, 2015 at 12.54 p.m., stating that he has not been the manager for over a year. So the essence of that complaint is, is that they went for a year, at least a year, without an approved licensed manager, which is a violation of state law and local, local bylaw. The five-year history of this establishment is no, shows no prior violations. Um, the the, ma the uh, bartender, Mr. Coles, had a valid server training certificate. The uh, aggravating circumstances of this particular case is kind of related to another establishment owned by the same owner in the sense that in 2011 uh, that another establishment owned by the owned by the Carlson's the Summer House Beachside Bistro was found to have be operating without a manager change of manager and the department spent a significant amount of time and effort to get them to get to the town and change that um, and, and request to change a manager it took several months to get them just to come in and do that it's a simple application. So the history is they know what has to be done. They haven't done it. Um, the Blue Book guidelines for this particular violation would call for a written warning for the sale or delivery of the alcoholic beverage to a person under 21 years of age. And it would call for a possible one-day suspension for each day of unjustified noncompliance for failure to have an approved manager. So that potentially could be 365 days, a year suspension. Our recommendation is to give a 15-day suspension with seven days served July 24th through the 30th, 2016, which is a Sunday through a Saturday, and seven days to be held in abeyance for a period of two years, provided no further violations, Chapter 138 or Town Nantucket rules occur. Same as the last um, establishment. Any questions for the Chief? So it sounds like this is a little different, Chief, just we don't have the history that we had in the prior case, but we have a history of sort of um, non-voluntary compliance where he could easily have complied. Right. Yeah. And just to be clear, the is is the owner of the establishment running the establishment at this time, or is the is there a someone renting the establishment? Uh, <laughs> no. Uh, the owner is still th listed as on the license as the owner, um, Mr. Carlson, and he's the articles of incorporation for his um, company, uh, which is uh, what, it, what was the name of that? Uh, 1709 Associates lists Mr. Carlson as the um, owner of it. So, um, so then no one's renting this. This no one's renting it, and okay. and the the law requires that any any establish any license holder that's held by a lic liquor license held by a corporation must have a designated licensee or manager that has full control of the establishment um, obviously uh, they had a gentleman there when we did the investigation that claimed to be the manager but the town which has the right under both state law and local jurisdiction and has an obligation to try to um, uh, uh, approve the manager because the law requires that they be a, a U.S. citizen, they not be convicted of a felony, and a couple other standards. 
um, we didn't have the benefit or the opportunity to test that standard on that individual. So, um, you know, this is actually a serious thing. It wasn't until we tried to serve the, the papers on the establishment, which we always try to serve the listed manager, that we learned of this problem. And this is kind of a problem that we've been having some difficult with through a lot of, a lot of establishments in town getting lazy about um, changing managers. And it's a serious problem. When we have a problem, who do we call? And we get the runaround a lot because, oh, he don't work here anymore. Oh, well, I don't remember. Where last, sometimes they don't even know who the guy is, the people that are working there. Thank you. Is there someone here representing a licensee? No. Okay. So we'll close the hearing. Um, sounds to me like we can find probable cause here. I, I recommend that the board, I move that the board uh, find that on, what was the date here this happened? July. July 22nd? Is July, that was it the same date, Chief? Uh, July, Wednesday, July 22nd. July 22nd. Correct. That the uh, sale of alcohol, that the Mass General Law 138, Section 34, sale of alcohol to underage persons occurred, mm -hmm. and that there was a violation of Mass General Law 138, Section 26, operating without an approved license manager, and also that the Town of Nantucket Regulations, Chapter 250, Section 16, change of manager was not found. Uh, is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Now, I um, would go with the recommendation. I'll, I'll make a motion that the uh, the board issue a seven day suspension be to, to be served between July twenty fourth and the thirtieth of twenty sixteen. And Rick, if you could help me out with this additional language, the additional seven days would be. I think he said we, we would hold it in abeyance as abeyance, long as for go. two years after the initial uh, suspension is completed, there are no further violations. That's my motion. Second. 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 All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you, Rick. All right. Next is, okay, next is the Islander. Um, just the note, the Islander is the establishment that did attend the seminar. Um, the uh, and and just also for the record, uh, each of these establishments was served with notice of this hearing, both in hand and certified mail. Um, so, you know, notice was properly delivered, um, and the proofs in the files. Um, on this particular case, uh, the following. Upon following completion of the investigation, the police department believes enough cause exists to refer the Islander Inc., the licensee, which holds an all alcoholic beverages package store license issued pursuant to Mass General Law Chapter 138, Section 15, to the Board of Selectmen for violation of the following town and Nantucket rules and regulations and or Mass General Laws. One count for violation of Mass General Law Chapter 138, Section 34, sale or delivery of alcoholic beverage to a person under 21 years of age. The fact is, the facts of the case are um, the Nantucket Police Department has authority to conduct these investigations under the Chapter 250. And on Monday, August 3rd, 2015, at approximately 4.50 p.m., Detective Whiting and Detective Cook conducted an investigation of the business operation at Islander, Inc., located at 15 so Old South Road. Two underage operatives working with the detectives purchased an alcoholic beverage, a six-pack of Coronita, Corona beer bottles for $7.75 in cash. The underage operatives, aged 19 and 20, were not asked for identification. Tammy Oates was identified by detectives as the person who sold the alcoholic beverage to the undercover operatives. Uh, the five-year history of this establishment um, says in 2012 they were, uh, had one count for underage sales, in which case the person who sold the alcohol was charged in the district court there was no action against the license holder. In 2013, they had two counts um, on two different occasions where they um, sold the underage um, operatives, and they served a three-day closure that they agreed to and the Board of Selectmen endorsed that they served January 15th through 17th in 2014. 
There are mitigating factors in that um, Ms. Oates provided a valid TIPS training certificate. The Blue Book guidelines in this case, Chapter 250, Section G, would, cause, would call for a five to six day suspension. The um, police department is recommending that a six day suspension be imposed with four days suspension to be served August 2nd through the 5th, 2016, which is a Tuesday through Friday, with two days held in abeyance for two years, provided no further violations of Chapter 138 or Town of Nantucket Rules and Regulations, Chapter 250 occurs. Questions for the Chief? So 2014 was clear for these folks? Uh, yes, they did have, they didn't have a violation in, in 2014. That's good. So we're recommending one day more than their three day closure last time. Is there someone here from the licensee who would like to speak? Turnover weekend. Um, oh, I'm sorry, Paula Driscoll, manager of the Islander. Um, it's uh, that would be pretty tough. I don't know if there's any other way that it could be made after Labor Day, um, but in the midst of summer, like I said, a turnover uh, week like that, August 1st, is considerable. That's all I got to say. All right. And Chief, the reason for the August 1st is because that's when the infraction occurred? Is that what we're going yeah, with? Yeah, two things we considered is one, the board's uh, previous actions a couple weeks ago seemed to indicate that they were targeting a year from the time that the incident occurred. Um, and also, we looked at all of them as we came to this conclusion, and we didn't want everything to be closed at one time, so we kind of spread it out over a little bit of time but not not much I guess I, I guess I just have one question what's the I mean this is necessarily to the chief but to Mrs. Uh, Driscoll why you didn't have any violations in in 2014 were there new policies you enacted certified within 30 days of hire um, I was one of the I was the first retailer who implemented a pretty sophisticated scanner of course they have to use it in order to have it work um, but I don't know it's very very frustrating because I don't know what more I could possibly do um, other than be there 24 7 and to be honest it could happen to me you know um, so it's just it's very very disheartening um, because you tell people what you expect of them, you give them the tools, and uh, and sometimes I'm afraid they don't comply. So she did get fired, uh, which I felt badly about, but that's not the way that I want to run my business, and she needs to know that, so she's gone. That's it. Thank you. Mr. Chairman? Yeah. Um, the police department, you know, I, I do know, I did mention the mitigating factors that they did have tips training. This is the one establishment that did attend the seminar. Not only Paula, but her employees attended the seminar. Um, I, we don't have an objection if you make a change on the dates uh, on that. Thank you for that, Chief. You know, the mitigating factors are helpful. If uh, not only the, the Paula, but everybody else showed up for the training is very helpful. Well, so let's um, anyway. Let's close the hearing, and uh, I'll move. That the board, well, I got to read this. Um, I move that the board find that on August 3rd, this uh, Mass General Law 138, Section 34, sale and delivery of alcoholic beverages to a person under 21 occurred, and that the town Nantucket Rules and Regulations, Chapter 250, Section 16, D4, sale and delivery by licensee of a person under 21 for use of their own use or use of others section 34 occurred is there a second, second? all those in favor all right aye. aye all right you know this is a i mean the fact that we had no violations in in 2013 
or 2014 14, yeah. that they you know made the effort to come to the seminar that they tip trained everyone and the first week of August is just it's the biggest week of the year to give somebody four days off for an employee who is no longer employed there. It'd be one thing if the person was still working there, but it's clear that they made an effort. Um, you know, if the we, so far tonight we've had 15 day suspensions that have been cut in half. This is a six day suspension that we're making them serve 75% of. I would suggest a six day suspension with three days served in maybe in July, not in August or yeah. in September, one or the other. Bobby, I mean, there are two approaches. One is to move the days, and I agree on the the mix of the, if it's six days, maybe it's three and three. But you could even, I'm a little reluctant to change a policy where we pick to the day. In other words, we, we could change the number of days they serve, even though that's a tough weekend. So that's just so we're clear, that's another option. You could say six days serve two, and four days is like the suspended sentence for two years. So I there are two options here. I was going to suggest that two days that week on Tuesday and Wednesday and four days held in advance. Is that a motion? Sure. Is there a second? I'll second it. The motion's been made and seconded for a two-day suspension occurring, uh, is it the second and third of August with four days held in, in advance, provided there's no violation over the next two years. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And I, th I just think we all want to, I think we all recognize in making that change, uh, the commitment of attending the sessions was a very important factor, so. Uh, next is, next, next would be Wisconsin Bookstore. Oh, I'm sorry. Yep. No, next is Murray's. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. On my list, Chief. Well, that's probably right. I get, I've been bouncing these things around here. Okay. Next one would be Murray's. Um, following completion of investigation, the NPD believes enough cause exists to refer Murray's Beverage Store LLC, the licensee, which holds an all alcoholic beverages package store license issued pursuant to Mass General Law Chapter 138, Section 15, to the Board of Selectmen for violation of the following town Nantucket rules and regulations and or Mass General Laws. One count for violation of Mass General Law Chapter 138, Section 34, say or delivery alcoholic beverage to a person under 21 years of age. Facts are the NPD has the authority to conduct these investigations. And on Wednesday, August 5th, 2015, at approximately 5.20 p.m., Detective Whiting and Detective Cook conduct an investigation of the business operation of Murray's Beverage Store located at 21 Main Street. Underage operatives working with the detectives purchased an alcoholic beverage, a six-pack of Bud Light beer bottles for $8 in cash. The underage operatives aged 19 and 20 were not asked for identification. Jamie McCoy was identified by detectives as the person who sold the alcoholic beverage to the undercover operatives. Um, the history of this establishment indicates that about 30 years ago they had an offense for underage sales. Um, <coughs> since then, we haven't seen or heard from them, so um, no five-year history. Uh, Mitigating factors in this case was McCoy did provide a valid serve, server training certificate. The Blue Book Guidelines, Chapter 250, Section G, recommend a written warning, and the MPD recommendation would be a written warning. I'll, sec I'll make a motion to... Wait, wait, wait. Oh, sorry. sorry. Um, Carl, do you have anything you want to say? You guys want to say anything? You're good? All right, I'm going to close the hearing. Um, there are significant findings. I make a motion to find that I gotta get to the right page here, sorry. On August 5th, um, the board finds that on August 5th, Mass General Law 138, Section 34, sale of alcohol, sale or delivery of alcoholic beverages to person under 21 occurred and that on the same date, the Town of Nantucket Rules and Regulations cha uh, Chapter 250, Section 16D4, sale and delivery of license, licensee of a person under 21 for own use or for other use, Section 34 occurred. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Now we get to the... Uh, I'll, I'll make a motion to issue a written warning to the establishment. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. 
Next one, Chief, is Sconset Bookstore. Okay. Um, in this case, uh, following the completion of the investigation, MPD believes that enough cause exists to refer Walt Rolf M. Nelson, the licensee, which holds an all alcoholic beverage package store license issued pursuant to Mass General Law Chapter 138, Section 15, to the Board of Selectmen for a violation of the following Town Nantucket Rules and Regulations and or Mass General Law. Uh, one count, Mass General Law Chapter 138, Section 34, sale or delivery of alcoholic beverage to a person under 21 years of age. The Town of Nantucket uh, Police Department has the right to conduct these investigations. And on Monday, August 3rd, 2015, at approximately 6.36 p.m., Detective Whiting and Detective Cook conducted an investigation of the business operation of Rolf Nelson doing business as Size Concept Bookstore. Two underage operatives working with the detectives purchased an alcoholic beverage, a six-pack of Grey Lady beer bottles, for $11 in cash. The underage operatives, aged 19 and 20, were not asked for identification. Edward Sullivan was identified by detectives as the person who sold the alcoholic beverage to the undercover operatives. There is no history for the last five years of this establishment. Um, however, the establishment did fail to provide a valid server training certificate. The Blue Book guidelines would call for um, a Chapter 250, Section G would call for a written warning. NPD, staying consistent with actions in your prior hearings, um, are recommending a one-day suspension to be served Monday, August 1, 2016, because of the aggravating factor of not having uh, TIPS training. Okay, is there anyone here representing the licensee? Rhoda? For the record, Rhoda Wyman, um, representing Rolf Nelson. Uh, Rolf has owned um, this establishment for uh, about six years. He also owns the Sconset Cafe um, abutting it, which he's owned for 20 years. Um, on the evening of the violation, uh, Mr. Sullivan sold beer uh, to the miners. He was working alone in a very busy um, evening. There are usually two people there, and there will be in the future. Uh, Mr. Sullivan's worked at this bookstore for four years, and prior to that, he worked at another um, liquor store and as a bartender. He had been tip trained. Um, he had been certified. Um, his certification had expired. It is now renewed and good for another three years. Um, I spoke to a woman today named Lawanda Craig, who's in charge of the Massachusetts TIP training program, and she um, confirmed to me that he had been TIPS trained and had been certified in the past. Um, since he had been TIP trained, he obviously understood and knew the procedure. Um, he made a mistake that evening, and um, I understand that, but I would respectfully request that... Um, you would consider suspending this sentence. It was the first time um, that it had ever happened, and he had been previously trained, and he now is certified. I have a copy of his certification, uh, which he renewed. And um, if you're not comfortable doing that, I would ask you that, um, you know, just hold it in abeyance as you've done with the others um, for the two-year period. Okay. Any other questions? I'll close the hearing. Um, I make a motion that significant findings for uh, violation of Mass General Law, Section 138, uh, Chapter 138, Section 34, sale delivery of alcoholic beverages to a person under 21, and one count of the Town and Tucker Rules, Chapter 250, Section 15, D4, sale and delivery by licensee of person under 21 for the use or the other use of alcohol, section 34. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Penalty phase. Um. There is no no violation history in the, fa in the past. The one-day suspension, uh, the blue book calls for a written warning, but the MPD, MPD recommends a one-day suspension, I'm assuming because he wasn't. Last. He didn't have an active tip training certificate. And but last, I think last time we did this, there was one establishment, I think, that had a violation and no tips training. So that's the the chief is drafting this well, policy off of our recommendation. Based on prior. No, prior number of violations, so one versus um, two versus three versus four. Can I ask a question? How yeah. how long had his tips training lapsed? 
like when it had expired? Um, I wouldn't know that because he wasn't able to produce a card for us or, or evidence that he had to that? tips training. Um, I mean, it's entirely possible that he had and it was expired, but the establishment, when we asked for the car, it wasn't able to provide one, so I wouldn't know. But um, may I? When I checked today um, with the department, she could only confirm that he had a prior certification and that it was renewed recently. She couldn't give me the period of time that um, it had lapsed, so I, I'm sorry I can't answer that, but I'd ask you to please, you know, consider um, holding it in abeyance. I'm comfortable holding it in abeyance. It seems like you know the gentleman was aware and that's had the training. It seemed like it lapsed. I'd make a motion that we issue a written warning and hold a one-day suspension in abeyance for Monday or follow for the next two years. Starting August 1st? Starting. No, you don't need the written warning. So we, we give him a one-day suspension. We hold it in abeyance starting to for tomorrow. two years starting August 1st, 2016. Is that correct? Yeah, which is the normal date if we had if we gave him a oh, suspension, right? Okay. So gotcha. it, it makes it a little tougher because it almost was like three years. So that's that that's fine. Great. Is that th that's the motion? Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. You're welcome. Next one is table one. One. Following completion investigation, the NPD believes enough cause exists to refer table, table number one LLC, doing business as table number one, the licensee, which holds a wine and malt beverage seasonal alcohol license issued pursuant to Mass General Law Chapter 138, Section 12, to the Board of Selectmen for violation of the following town in Nantucket. I'm, I'm not sure if they got a Section 12 or Section 15, but in any event... Uh, Violation of the following town Nantucket rules and regulations and or Mass General Laws. One count for violating Mass General Law Chapter 138, Section 34, sale or delivery of alcoholic beverage to a person under 21 years of age. NPD does have authority to conduct these investigations under 250, Section 2, Paragraph 7. The, on Monday, August 3, 2015, at approximately 7.18 p.m., Detective Whiting and Detective Cook conducted an investigation of the business operation of table number one located at 7 Old South Wharf. Underage operatives working with the detectives purchased an alcoholic beverage, a bottle of Nantucket Vineyards Pinot Noir, Pinot Noir, whatever, uh, for $20 in cash. The underage operatives, aged 19 and 20, was not asked for identification. Sarah Powers was identified by detectives as the person who sold the alcoholic beverage to the undercover operative. The establishment has no prior history. Um, there were several uh, aggravating factors in that Powers was unable to provide a valid TIPS training certificate or any type of server training certificate, and the staff was not suitably trained, and they did not attend the seminar put on by the town. Um, the Blue Book guidelines would be a written warning. The NPD recommendations, a one-day suspension, be served Monday, August 1, 2016. Rhoda, are you representing this one as well? For the record, Rhoda Weinman, um, as you know, this um, is a brand new business. This is um, Ms. Powers' first year running the business. She had gone online to um, begin her education with the TIPS training program. She did not complete it until, um, unfortunately, after the incident. She now has her certification. Um, she has advised me that the other people that work there have gone through the training and had gone through it before the incident, so that isn't exactly what the chief just indicated, but um, I was told that everyone there, with the exception of herself, had gone through it. She owns it, runs it, um, doesn't necessarily um, sell behind the counter every day, but she obviously should have been tips trained, and she now is. Um, so I would ask you to consider um, holding this one also for two years since it's a brand new establishment and um, she has complied at this point as has um, all of her other employees. Thank you. Chief? Bobby, you'd make a great judge by the way. <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> Um, 
I think the, the factor here is Ms. Powers is listed as the licensed manager, and the regulations specifically require the licensed manager to be certified at the time they're approved as a licensed manager. So somebody at some time checked a box that said they were TIPS trained, and uh, apparently she wasn't. So that's kind of our, our position on this whole thing. May I just ask for clarification of what box you're referring to? Well, that is on, on the application for manager of the liquor license. There, at the time when you apply for a change of manager or a manager right. designation, you have to be cer certified with alcohol server right. trading according to the regulation. Um, so at some point, somebody indicated to us somehow or other that that was the case because we asked that question um, about that. We generally want to see the certificate. I'm not, I'm yeah. Not so that that's why we went with the um, staff not suitably trained because we figured the manager's not properly trained, even though the manager specifically required before they even get designated as a manager, um, the employees were also problematic. So. Okay. Well, my information is that everybody there is <laughs> tips trained at this point. So. Okay. I'm going to make a motion that. I move that the board find that on August 3rd, the licensee violated Mass General Law 138, Section 34 by the sale or delivery of alcoholic beverages to the person under 21 years of age. And furthermore, that the town Nantucket rules and regulations, uh, Chapter 250, Section 16, sale or delivery by licensee of persons under 21 for, the use, for their own use or other uses. That's Second. Motion. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. So now, the blue book calls for a one, for written warning. The chief's recommendation is for a one-day suspension to be served on August 1st uh, based on the fact that the manager was not tips trained, even though when they filed for their liquor license, and this clearly indicates that they're supposed to be tips trained at the time, they weren't. Um, the applicant's argument, or the licensee's argument, is that they're a new establishment and that they should get the one-day suspension and have it in advance. In advance. What's the pleasure of y'all? Well, I, I, guess I, I feel that um, you know that when, when you do sign the application, I think that's a serious enough matter for us to pay attention to the chief's recommendation. So. I'll make a motion to issue a uh, one-day suspension for August 1st, 2016. 2016. Is there a second? Second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. One more, Chief. VFW. Seems like a lot. Um, Following completion investigation, the MPD believes enough probable cause enough cause exists to refer Sydney and Robert Henderson Post 8608, VFW US Incorporated, the licensee, which holds an all alcoholic beverage club license issued pursuant to Mass General Law Chapter 138, Section 12, to the Board of Selectmen for violation of the following town and Nantucket rules and regulations and or Massachusetts general laws. One count of Mass General Law Chapter 138, Section 34, sale or delivery of alcoholic beverage to a person under 21 years of age. The NPD has the authority to conduct these investigations, and on Wednesday, August 5th, 2015, at approximately 5.57 p.m., Detective Whiting and Detective Cook conducted an investigation of the business operation of Sidney and Robert Henderson, post 8608 VFW U.S. Incorporated. Two underage operatives working with the detectives purchased an alcoholic beverage, a Grey Lady beer, for $2 in cash. The underage operatives, aged 19 and 20, were not asked for identification. Kimberly Nolan was identified by detectives as the person who sold the alcoholic beverage to the undercover operatives. There is no prior history with this establishment. Um, Nolan did provide a valid server training certificate. The Blue Book Guidelines, Chapter 250, Section G, call for a written warning. The MPD recommends a written warning. Kelly, you here? You got anything to say? Okay. All right. I'm going to close the hearing. Uh, I move. I move that the board find that on August fifth, 
The licensee violated Mass General Law 138, Section 34, sale of delivery of alcoholic beverages to a person under the age of 21. And the town's rules and regulations, Chapter 250, Section 16, sale and delivery by a licensee to persons under age 21 for their own use or other uses occurred. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. A recommendation by the town, uh, by the chief, is for a one day, I mean for a written warning. I'll make a motion for a written warning. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. I'm done with that. And if I could further add, um, I don't think any of the board members enjoy this process, but the purpose of this process is to ensure that people um, can come to the island and safely consume alcohol. And this is a tool that we use to try to get across to people that consuming alcohol is um, a serious matter. And we would hope that the people selling alcohol take that seriously because it is our responsibility to issue licenses. And whenever I hear about accidents or problems, I feel a bit responsible in the, f in the sense that we even issue a, a license for people to sell in the first place. So I'd encourage everybody to conduct themselves responsibly. Thank you. Okay. So, can I see a show of hands of how many people would like to make a comment on the 40B? No, it's not, well, not, not nowhere near as bad as I thought. Okay. That's good. All right. We're going to, here's what we're going to do. Um, we're going to, do you, how do you guys want to do this? Do you want to take public comment first and then have a deliberation amongst ourselves? Or do you want to do? Yeah, I, I think I that's think a good idea. Okay. Yep. So, if you all could sort of line up. On the opposite mics, we'll try to get through this as quickly as possible. And we appreciate you all yeah. waiting around to uh, speak. Um, let's try not to repeat the same thing over and over again. If somebody has something new, I mean, we're. I think we're all. We've all heard from numerous members of the public over the last week about this since the article came out in the paper, and we're all very aware of how this is going to cause infrastructure challenges, traffic on Surfside Road. Yeah, you know all that good stuff so and we will most likely be holding an official public hearing to take comment in the future Matt I'm gonna go to the bathroom and you're in charge for five minutes uh, <laughs> I can really mess it up in five minutes you've done such a good job all right Catherine you, f you up first yes, Catherine Stover 5 Liberty Street not enough is being done for local people who are struggling to stay here we don't need any more housing for folks for whom $500,000 is considered affordable, whether by legal definition or because there's no other option. The 40 Bs aren't cutting it here because after paying the monthly rent, there isn't sufficient money for food and other necessities. There certainly isn't any overflow for savings to put aside for a future down payment. The Nantucket people are weary of the struggle, and they are looking for leadership and action. We are tired of what appears to be the elected and appointed officials in this town making it easy and profitable for folks from away to make a virtual killing here and then leave with their coffers full and our community diminished. I beg that the selectmen take immediate steps to take 106 Surfside Road by eminent domain for municipal purposes. 106 Surfside Road would be a good location for the town of Nantucket to create a tiny house village. These houses can be purchased and delivered for $25,000 each. It's what's needed for our workforce of single persons, young couples, retired couples, and small families. The tiny house movement is not going away. It's a viable option for Nantucketers. If we had several of them located discreetly around the island, we wouldn't need any more 40 Bs. All right, thank you. Anyone else? wanted to speak a little bit to what I understand as the selectman's role. Actually, uh, introduce yourself sorry, for the camera. My name is Greg Henson, 36 Battle View. And Greg, if you could just hold the mic up yeah. for those at home. Thank you. Great. At home. Um, as been looking into the matter a little bit, and as I understand the process, uh, the, our Board of Selectmen has a very important role here in the very early stages of this process. So as these 40 Bs are applied, they're applied typically if someone wants state financing to one of the four financing agencies, essentially one of the four public banks that can be used to finance one of these projects. And in this case, it's been applied to the Massachusetts Housing Partnership. 
there's a guide that's been published online by the Massachusetts Housing Partnership that very specifically says right now is the time for the citizens to speak up through their elected officials during the 30-day comment period that we're going to see. Prior to it going to the Zoning Board of Appeals, prior to going to any other local boards, this is the only chance that our Board of Selectmen have a chance to make a comment. And I'm going to read a little bit from that guide that's published online by Massachusetts Housing Partnership. They actually give some very specific um, recommendations uh, to, the, uh, to the Board of Selectmen or Mayor or whichever chief elected town officials are to comment. They say that if the community's comments are detailed, factual, and focused, they're more likely to affect the subsidizing agency's decision on whether and under what conditions to issue a project eligibility letter, which before it even goes to ZBA. To be effective, our Board of Selectmen's comments should be limited to legitimate municipal planning and public health and safety concerns. They give examples of constructed comments that might include relationship between the pro proposed 40B development and a local affordable housing plan, existing infrastructure such as roads, water, sewer, the environment such as traffic or groundwater quality, and suggestions or suggestions on how to uh, modify the design to better fit the surrounding neighborhood. It, they go on to say that it's not effective for communities to make comments that go beyond the scope of local review authority of 40B, for example, commenting that a 40B is opposed by neighbors or would result in increased service costs. These are not valid legal reasons for them to deny a permit. Uh, so my take on this is this is the developer's chance of getting pre-approval for a mortgage. Um, that bank has a chance to actually speak to whether or not the project is feasible at all. So they can, they're, they're, they're looking for our comments during that 30-day period. And they, they really make a strong point that this is really the only part of the process where you guys have a role. So it's not right that you don't need to hear us just wait for ZBA. During this initial 30-day period, it's our chance through our elective officials, our only chance to have a comment. So that's my comment. Just to follow Bobby, is that the 30 days we heard earlier, and is that 30-day period running? No, it is no, not. It Just want to be clear. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Lou Borelli from 16 Gladlands. Mm -hmm. uh, you all received a letter already from me, so I won't repeat that. Uh, the... Uh, application that I have that was posted online has a date of August 19th. I don't know whether that's a ticking clock for this 30 days or not. If it's not, then I'm, I'm not as nervous as I was when I first got it. Uh, and I guess the only thing that I would add is that uh, while I understand and I appreciate the fact that we do have a, a housing crisis or a situation or something that needs to be addressed, I don't think anyone who has lived on this island for some time would find it reasonable to put several hundred people in cars and two acres with up to two and a half or three story buildings in a residential area where you basically have one or one and a half story homes. Um, I, you know, I, again, I know this is it's a conundrum, but I, but I do think that the particulars of this case really speak to more of the potential that this property affords the developer if they're successful with the Boy Scout property. And, and that is what really concerns me. I think that if you're using these regulations to basically look at any plot of land on the island, regardless of zoning, to put in highly dense apartment type complexes, then no part of the island is safe. So I think as, as our elected officials, we implore you to use the leadership and the judgment that you have to try and solve the situation and to solve the greater situation that we all face. Thank you. Oh, good evening. Tom Quigley from the Surfside Association. I'd just like to remind the board that uh, the master plan for Nantucket under the NEDCP uh, required that the Surfside area hold a, uh, a, a, create a master plan, which we did. It took about two years to write the master plan, and there were nine elements to it. And according to one of those elements was density. And this particular project does not fit into what we considered into our master plan. So I would ask you that you look at and review the Surfside Association master plan as part of your deliberations and keep that in mind that this is not what we particularly care for in our particular area uh, with all the work we did. I'll also remind you that we have several 
Uh, we're not against 40Bs. We're not against affordable housing. We have several pieces of affordable housing in Surfside. We have several 40Bs there already, and we have several others on the books. So please take those into your consideration when you're writing your report and your considerations to the Zoning Board of Appeals. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, Jim, Dal Jim Dalzell's uh, Gladlands app. Um, I'd just like to uh, follow up on a comment that Matt made to tonight um, in reference to, um, again, additional driveways and uh, parking areas. Um, I think it goes back to the Surfside plan as well. Um, is this whole issue of the amount of parking that will be needed in almost like an asphalt jungle um, of sorts. And uh, the contractor had indicated over and over at uh, one of the meetings that I attended that uh, this particular piece or this particular project should represent the way it looks in downtown Nantucket or as well as the way it should look in Sias Concert. And again, uh, Surfside is a very rural area at this point and it would definitely change the whole um, atmosphere of the community. Thank you. Yes, sir. My name, <clears throat> my name is Jack Benjamin. I live at 20 Gladlands Avenue. <clears throat> I've been here for 28 years. And uh, one of the things that, that brought me to this island was the natural beauty and the feeling to be part of a community that was beautiful, aesthetic, bucolic, and peaceful. The stretch of seaside, of Surfside Beach, uh, and dr driving down Surfside, and similar if you're also in Humboldt Pond and going to Cisco Beach, are two of the most beautiful places in New England. Many, many people come here to appreciate this wonderful natural beauty. We now have the Satcham Pass situation, which has been approved and is happening. And at the same time, within an eighth of a mile away, we have this situation at 106 uh, Surfside, which is so close to Satcham's Pass. I think anybody who comes to Surfside Beach as a visitor or somebody who would eventually like to live here would find this whole situation sort of not a nice kind of thing to feel when it was such a beautiful gorgeous road with bicycles and people riding slowly to the beach and enjoying the beautiful benefits of this wonderful island I'd like everybody to take consideration of what these apartment houses would do as uh, not to repeat what this gentleman just said but as Matt Fee said why would you take beautiful yards and turn it into parking lots, why would you take a gorgeous, natural, beautiful setting and turn it into an apartment complex? Anyone else? Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is DJ McKinnon. I'm from Atlantic Development, and uh, we're actually the developer for the proposed Surfside Commons. Uh, I heard there was a meeting tonight, uh, kind of at the last minute, so I did show up. Uh, not prepared to make a presentation tonight, and possibly when the 30-day comment period comes uh, or starts, would you know, would look forward to uh, coming back to make a full presentation. Uh, I'd like to start out by saying that uh, uh, trying to address the year-round rental housing needs on Nantucket uh, is going to be a big challenge, and uh, we look forward to trying to work with the people in the community on this proposal and possibly future proposals. Um, you know, based on the workforce housing needs assessment that came out this spring, 90% of the people on this island that live here year-round cannot afford to buy housing. I think you're going to see uh, rental communities as a way to serve, you know, the next, possibly next couple generations of people on this island. Uh, I'm sure every one of them, whatever neighborhood they're proposed in, is going to meet with a number of challenges that uh, need to be, we all need to work together on, both with the community, the potential renters, uh, as well as the neighbors. Um, I, uh, we have put out a flyer that gives kind of an overview of our proposal. On that is our contact information. Uh, I'm happy to meet with, with anybody and everybody on the island that would like to meet 
would like to discuss this, has questions, concerns, or many people, uh, which we're hearing from quite a few, that actually have a need for rental housing on the island. So uh, with that, happy to come back at any time, happy to speak with anybody in the audience, uh, or happy to set up a time to uh, talk with them about their individual questions, concerns, or needs. Thank you. Anyone else? Pat, you're next. Allison Townsend. Allison, um, can you please come close to the Allison mic? Allison Townsend, Thank you. 8 Clifford. Um, I, I am certainly aware of the problem of the need for affordable housing. Um, it's, it's definitely an issue. However, um, we have so much of it right in our area of Surfside that I think the best thing to be done is that the town or whoever needs to really consider having other areas in the island having affordable housing. Right now we have so much right concentrated in Surfside and another development such as Atlantic Development the on two and a half acres with so many units on such a small piece of property just doesn't make sense. So thank you. Thank you. Pat? Patrick Tafe, 21 Okawa. It just seems to me that this area is fairly saturated right now, and I think that's something that could be prohibitive to something like this moving forward. Um, and I also just want to say Nantucket should solve Nantucket's problems. People that know the island, people that live here, people that are vested here, people that plan on spending their entire lives here. Um, I think that maybe on this year's town warrant there should be some articles that help protect Nantucketers and maybe we could come up with a solution for housing ourselves instead of having things shoved down our throats uh, that are not appropriate at all. Um, we need to do it as an island. We all need to get together and figure this out rather than having, I'm repeating myself, but other people tell us how to do it. Anyone else? Mr. Fredericks? Mr. Chairman, uh, Dave Fredericks. I wasn't sure if you were going to continue at the end to talk about what you might be thinking about as a board as you consider 40Bs, but because of what's going on, I'll just I'll bring to you what I was going to hand out. There's an interesting document. It's called the Housing Production Plan. It's put out by the Department of Housing for the state of Massachusetts. It's a seven-page guide on how a community goes about building a plan that addresses this in a way that is consistent with all state regulations. I thought I'd hand a copy to Erica. I know that uh, some of the planning staff have seen it. Um, I think it's a good basis for having a, a public discussion, I think, that Pat's referring to. Yeah. Eric, if you could distribute that to all of us in our boxes, that would be great. Um, any other comments from the public? Wow. Good job, everyone. Um, comments from the board? I guess just just one general thought um, was that I know there's been a lot of 40Bs over the past on Nantucket, and I know part of the idea, and I wish Nat was here, but he ran out, but part of the idea of behind the 40B was that it enabled more affordable housing to be created um, but by the developer. But at the same time that's happened on Nantucket, that the concept of a 40B is an enable the developer to develop more, and, and this is roughly in my mind, but at the same time create affordable housing so it kind of strikes some sort of balance. And maybe that was at the time. And I'm wondering, you know, this the past couple of years being on the board and being involved in development and thinking about it makes me curious if if that model was something that had the intention of trying to solve some of these problems, which just doesn't, you know, it, it seems like in the state's infinite wisdom that it would, but on Nantucket, due to the fact that we're a service-based economy and we need to provide services for people for every one of these houses we build because they're secondary homes, and this doesn't apply directly to this project, but in general, the concept of 40Bs, that that's just something for me that I'm curious and if anybody in the community has kind of done that research into the history of 40Bs and how they you know, evolve and affect the community because it is based on this idea of having numbers but that model 
of getting that affordability element and that development element doesn't line up on Nantucket. You know, I, I'm not sure where we're going with this. This is a tough subject, and you know, people own property and they can process applications and do what they do. Um, I think we need to find a way as a group, and maybe working with the planning board, and, and consider how how do we respond. We've talked about putting a hundred units as the number in my mind here, and to me, that's a very aggressive assertive position of the town to undertake. And I think um, in many ways, our commitment to doing that has to be um, reinforced. Um, so I think that's important as we deal with this. There may be other locations on the island that are preferable to the 106 location. And I think if that's the case, we ought to try and think about that and express that. Um, maybe we can influence the location of some of these projects. But unless we uh, sort of dialogue it and think about other sites, um, it could easily pass us by and these things can happen again and again. So, Bobby, I'm not sure how to get at this, but we need to sort of, you know, so, so for example, obviously there's discussion of, that I've heard about the property between the Sanford Boat, Boat Building and the Boys and Girls Club. <laughs> which I guess is owned by Atlantic Development or at least the stop and shop. I don't, I don't know any of those particulars. Is that a location? I'm not sure if it is or isn't, but there are places like that that might make more sense. And if we're going to get involved, we've got to do it pretty promptly. Otherwise, we're going to be on a timeline that I think just keeps moving forward here. So. We, we need to, to get to our 10%. I think the number is in the... Four hundreds of units that we need to qualify. Three, three twenty, three forty, something like that. I, think. I thought it was a little higher, like four. It's, it's, a, it's four fifty total. There's one hundred twenty units there. Okay. Four fifty minus. So I think I think as a community, we really do need to think quickly about where we can live with some increased density to address this. But at the at the same time, Don, and, and I agree with you, at the same time we increase, if we increase density and we're not providing affordability, we're continuing to put ourselves. Well, you know, if, if, if we do 10 houses that are affordable and 30 houses that aren't affordable, then we're further behind, you know what I'm I saying? I would like to look into fur further available subsidies to put some kind of a cap across the board on some development this is a this is a whole new animal uh, you know we've had 40 bees in the past we had the one down um, what is it down off of New South Shore Road there's Abrams Court there's one over and uh, off Rugged Road but these are different those were 40 B subdivisions where one, four, three houses were sold at market value and one was sold as an affordable unit, these are these are neighborhoods where people are living in. This is a new animal. This is an apartment complex, mm -hmm. and you know, you don't have to look. You look at the housing study, and you realize that we've done such a great job preserving the open space in Nantucket that we've driven real estate prices through the roof. And the next generation of Nantucketers don't even think they can. They, they don't even have the concept of owning a home here, so they want to have a rental property. Um, we also. Sent a pretty strong message to town meeting this year that we didn't want any more development. So, if you're sitting on a piece of land that's bigger than two acres or bigger, about the only way you're going to develop it is to go through the 40B process. And this is probably not going to be the only one we see here in the next year. Um, myself personally, I I I want to get educated rather quickly on what are what is a 40B and what what as, I think it was Mr. Hinson who said what are the what are the pertinent comments we need to make. And not, I mean, as if I lived in this neighborhood, I'd be upset too. But we can make all those comments to the state about how it's going to not fit in the neighborhood and and so forth. And th that's there's no sense making those comments if it's not going to have any kind of impact on the state's decision on this. So I think we need to find out what, in fact, are the pertinent um, items that we need to make comment on and make them make them make those comments through staff and through. The planning office and and through the neighborhood associations and 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 try to have some control in these. Otherwise, 
they're just going to start popping up everywhere, and there's not a whole lot we can do about it. And, and Bobby, just to, just to add into that more, I think you know, part of this idea of going up to the state and um, getting some sort of approval has to do with the fact that the state is trying to promote a, uh, a way forward that has some level of affordable housing in it. And I think the conundrum we find ourselves in is that that policy on Nantucket doesn't work. You know, if you're building, you know, 10 houses that are affordable and the other 30 aren't affordable, you know, we're just going in the wrong direction. So I think to, to kind of deal with this problem systemically um, over the long term, we're going to have to look at getting to that 10% that Don mentioned, which enables us to not have 40 Bs happening left and right. Um, and that's where we need to focus on a community is how do we enact policies um, at town me you know this coming town meeting um, that encourage people to build permanently affordable units that go towards the count you know tiny houses properly placed that seems like a great idea to me there's you know places that they would fit I think and there's a history mm -hmm. in Sconset and um, a number of places where smaller units are appropriate um, so I, I, I just encourage the board to think more systemically and long term about this and the community um, there's solutions here but we have to understand that the system that the state has at least in my mind is, is trying to solve a problem but on Nantucket that problem doesn't work yeah, I, I've always had the feeling that we have um, sort of affordable at least affordable seasonal workforce housing that I'm not sure the state recognizes so I think we're in many ways, the community, Big C, provides a lot of workforce housing already. And I don't think we necessarily get credit on a 40B one-size-fits-all state law, whatever it is. So I think we need, as a community, as, as the gentleman here said, think about ways to influence the state that we want to solve our own problem and that we can and that we have some ideas to move forward with because... You know, if it's just 15% of the units in a 40B or whatever that number is, ratio, 25 that are coveted and the rest are just market rentals, I'm not sure whether we're really going to accomplish what we hope to accomplish. It's not just a supply side problem. So. Well, because you also have to look at the numbers and we're building another 150, 200 houses along with the 40 that come up there. So you need services for those and where do you, where do, you do that? I think uh, when the people from the state came, uh, I tagged along and met some of it. And some of the things we can do, uh, zoning board can ask that the, anything is permanently affordable. It doesn't have to just be 30 years. 30 years is the minimum. And that's something we haven't done in the past. Uh, we've also kind of done this to ourselves because we let our production plan lapse and we didn't follow it to begin with. So if you know, we can all talk as much as we want to talk about stuff, but unless there's somebody charged with you know, following through and doing this plan, then we're going to we're going to be talk about the same thing. We were talking about this 15 years ago. We'll be talking about it 15 more. So we really need to, you know, someone has to own it and someone has to really follow it. Uh, and I'm, that's discussions we need to have, you know, as we go forward. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a bunch of things. You know, I, there are places where I think density is appropriate, and there are places where it's not appropriate. Uh, you know, we've we've spent a lot of money doing planning, and we've got. You know the wastewater treatment plan size for a certain aspect. We've got sewer districts and non-sewer districts. We have density in certain areas. They should be within a five-minute walk of, uh, you know, stores and, and services. It's, it's a, there's a bunch of things that we should be following, and so I hope that that all is part of the conversation. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Quigley, again, uh, in the instant case uh, before you today about 106 Surfside Road. I think there's a possible solution that the board could take if they use their influence. It, it reverts back to the firehouse and the property that it sits on today. The firehouse is going to move and that property is going to become available. The obvious person to purchase that property would be Stop and Shop. At the moment, Stop and Shop has a lease with Atlantic Development for the Sanford property, but that lease could be properly broken and or, or done away with and this particular 106 Surfside area development could be placed on the Sanford property which to me is more site specific closer to town closer to the buildings closer to everything that you need and you could have your buildings there which would be 
equal in size to the one at the boys club and the stop and shop building and it would be an equitable solution to this particular problem and I ask that the board take this into consideration and use whatever influence they have to make this possibly happen thank you just one cl clarification that's the former Craig property not the Sanford property Excuse me, could I just add one comment? I'm, I'm not, I, and I don't want this to go back and forth, but uh, I just want to clarify one thing on numbers. Uh, the state under 40B uh, deals with for sale uh, developments different than rental developments. So if you do a for sale development, 25% uh, of the units uh, need to be affordable, and only the units that are sold as affordable units count towards the subsidized housing inventory, that SHI, that number you're talking about. Under the rental model, uh, if we do 60 units, 25% uh, are proposed as moderate rate rentals, but all 60 units count towards that SHI count. So the rental model is different than the for sale in that when you do the rental, all of the units in the rental actually count towards that 10% number, which puts the town in a position of, uh, of having more control, uh, even though only 25% actually are moderate rate, the others are market rate. So you may just want, I, I just wanted to offer that so you're aware of that. Obviously, you can talk to the planning folks and get a further definition. Yeah. Mr. Frederick. If I can, um, what, I, what I gave you is um, a document that, w without repeating what everyone's saying, what, what I would point at is, and, and again, this isn't, has nothing to do with this gentleman. They spend an enormous amount of money. It's what I did for a living on these projects anywhere from 5 to 15% on the front end. So say this is a $15 million project. If the town wants to get in front of this once and for all, as Matt points out, we've looked at it, we've looked at it. One thing we have to recognize is we need to set a date. If it's April 15th at the next town meeting, we need to back up and say, what do we need to deliver? How do we deliver? And we need to be honest with ourselves that it's a cost. And, and I believe you, you have some very nice lawyers. I know most of them. And, and they run quite a bit of money per hour and we have to recognize that if we want to take this issue on it's going to be an investment like the sewers Bob it's not going to be a bunch of citizens sitting around coming up with ideas but very talented paid professionals putting together a plan in 90 days vetting it in 90 days and voting on it in 90 days that's the schedule or we're going to be reacting every six months to the next 40b because we as a community aren't sending very clear messages what we value, where it belongs. The gentleman's point's absolutely right. Rentals are a good thing. Rentals get you the most credit towards getting the 40B regulation off your back. That's the advantage of the rental. The disadvantage is that you really give up control. You're going to give up control to a third-party renter, or we're going to get into the housing business if you want to get those numbers down quickly. There are many great ideas, but we don't have six months to talk about them, six more months to talk after that. We have to decide that by April we have a plan we want to present in the form of a policy if we want to get in front of this and send market the right message so it meshes as best as it can for the island. Well said, David. Well, it looks like we have our work cut out for us. All right. I think that covers the 40B for now. Um, next on our agenda is discussion regarding downtown construction and contractor parking. Thank you everyone for staying and starting the conversation. Everyone. Uh, Erica, do you want to go through this with us? Or is um, Libby going to I'll, I'll just start it okay. and Erica can supplement. We wanted to make the board aware and the public as well, and we'll try to get some of this stuff on the website. There are continuing construction projects that are going to be going on in the downtown area into the fall and winter, as there have been for the last three at least winters. There are one, two, three, four, five that are going to be in progress. A couple of new and some continuing. Five North Water Street, that's the White Heron Theater. 
they have a special permit with the planning board. They can resume exterior construction this month, starting September 15th. They are going to be requesting sidewalk and road closings for Whalers Lane and or North Water Street from time to time between September 15th and April 1st, roughly. During holiday weekends, they will be required to keep sidewalks and streets open, such as Christmas Stroll and Daffodil. So that's that area. 17 Broad Street, that's the new hotel across from the town building. They have a special permit as well. They can resume exterior construction on September 15th. They also are going to be requesting sidewalk and road closings, mostly for Broad Street, but for a period of time on North Water Street as well, in between mid-September and mid-May. And again, we'll require them to keep the roads and sidewalks open for holiday weekends. Bookworks at 25 Broad does not have any special permits. Construction's been ongoing there. I don't think that's been a major issue. And we're waiting for a construction update from Anderson. I got that today. Okay. And um, they are anticipating that the landscaping will be wrapping up at the end of next week and that they open up around October 1st. So that project is okay. coming so to that, close. Okay, so that's going to be wrapping up. 22 Federal, that's the remain building, can resume their exterior construction per their special permit on October 1st. And hopefully that will wrap up early winter-ish. We're, we're, did you get an update I haven't on gotten, that one? I haven't okay. heard back from that. So we're waiting for an update on that one. 14 Easy Street, which isn't right in this area, but okay. is over on Easy Street. By the basin. Across the street from um, the bulkhead there, the, the Easy Street Basin. They have a special permit. They have been able to resume exterior construction as of Labor Day, and we are waiting for a construction update on them. Did we? Did we? Okay. So that obviously is going to be proceeding through the fall and winter and probably into the spring, I would guess. So just FYI. Okay, so a couple of things yep. that come jump out at me right away. Uh, the one on Easy Street, any road closures there need to be? Um, they haven't indicated that yet, but there may be from time yeah, to time. That's I, the main I truck route to the boat, so right. any road closures need to be well in advance and well advertised and not like come in on a Monday or a, on a Friday saying we're closing the road on Monday yep. kind of deal. At least seven days of notice. Um, they can't close the road. They yep. can't just show up with a cement truck and block the road for two hours. Well, um, that's what we believe as well, and sometimes they do it anyway, in which case the police will be sent over there to move them along. Yeah. I, Erica is Who's exceptionally... The contractor there? Uh, Jonathan Wraith. Jonathan Wraith is the contractor at 14 Easy Street. I have an email into him. I've explained to him that um, we are very cognizant about street and sidewalk blockings. It's a main artery into the steamship authority. It's Obviously, a fire lane as well. Trucks I mean, and everything. Um, I did reach out to the ZBA administrator um, to see if they had any pre construction plans with them, but apparently it's not required by their ZBA special permit. So. Um, there was nothing in the works, but again, I, you know, I'm trying to reach out to the contractor to see what their schedule is looking like and to discuss any upcoming blockings that they may be requesting so we can get those coordinated um, in a way that works for everyone. So that's that one. Then Broad Street, the sidewalks are the, um, on the... Uh, Remain building, are they all? They're not going to have to block that sidewalk off again like they did last winter, are they? How about the other side of the street? Um, Do we know? <clears throat> so last week, uh, I called a meeting with the contractors for Five North Water Street and Seventeen Broad. That's Anderson Co Company. Um, also present was the police chief, Lieutenant McVicker, um, a couple of people from the DPW, uh, the deputy fire chief. We also included some of the people that, you know, run businesses in the surrounding areas, including the NHA. Uh, we invited the Yacht Club and a couple of the guest house owners and Patricia Halstead, who has a law office right across the street from the project um, at 5 North Water. And um, we had a really good meeting. We went through their construction schedules. They, were, they provided us uh, 
schedules for both. We talked about some of the best ways to handle the um, the closings and what is going to be required. I think overall, um, I guess you put, oh, he's still here. Um, everybody was pretty much on the same page. They seem to want to be very, very cooperative. They understand it's a, um, it's a burden on the town, but it's also a necessity of their construction projects. Um, and I think it was really good that we had some of the stakeholders involved too because everybody's on the same page from the beginning. Um, they are anticipating needing to block the sidewalk on Broad Street on the north side. Um, one of the things we talked about is possibly blocking it as close to as 21 Broad because the rest of those buildings will be closed down for the winter. And that way because there's a sidewalk already, a crosswalk um, right here by the Brotherhood. So we would pr try to put people across the street already and then over to here so that they don't have to walk through the construction areas. Um, and that's going to have to be blocked because they're going to be doing uh, masonry, landscaping, sidewalling, uh, roofing, and all that. And okay. so it's a safety factor. It'd be nice if they could blo not block it from the Monday before Thanksgiving till the Monday after stroll. So it's a 10-day period there when the height of the fall sales and traffic are two weeks in our two weeks of August and November December happen. If you know, uh, we've all been to the city where they stage it and then block it from above, or you know, if they could open it up or make access to that side of the road during that holiday period, if they could plan their construction schedule around that ten days, it would be. A lot less burdensome on the merchants and yeah. shop owners I mean, on that side of the road. I mean, we did talk to them about making sure that they were open and available for holiday weekends, such as Thanksgiving and Columbus Day weekend and stroll and things like that. And they were very accommodating in terms of what they're willing to do. You we know. didn't talk about a full ten days. Well, a lot of people um, come for Thanksgiving and stay through stroll. It's a busy yeah. period there. That and of course, there is nothing on that stretch of the north side of Broad Street that is open. So that's why we were in keep it in you know all kind of on the same page and thinking that it would be probably better to just keep it blocked. What they did say was if the weather holds, that they might be done with that exterior portions that are creating the blockage in 30 days. Yeah. So they may be done well before November yeah. um, if I mean, the weather holds. Obviously, we want these projects done and this to be over with by yeah. the end of this winter, and who knows what the weather is going to be. But if there's any way that they could have that opened up, at least be, at least the Wednesday before Thanksgiving till the Monday after stroll, that seven-day period, because that's that's a busy week for all of our shops and restaurants and and guest houses. A lot of people come for the holidays and they stay right through. I, I think a bigger concern than that sidewalk is, you know, if we're going to give this as their parking space, then I don't, I would not like to see them parking and just accepting tickets everywhere else. You know, they have to be cognizant yep. of the other businesses that are trying to operate, the Brotherhood and the Bookworks when it opens, and you know, Languedoc, those people yep. are all still operating, and it's not fair to them to have cars parked in front of their business all day long. And we did talk about that. Um, we <coughs> talked a lot about carpooling, um, about trying to make sure just the, necess you know, the necessary trucks are parked out front, um, and to take advantage of the two-hour parking areas that aren't going to be enforced after September 30th. Right. Um, so just to keep the necessary ones out front, a lot of it is going to be, um, you know, if there's roofers there, it'll probably be the roofers being there. Um, if it's Toscana with their trucks, it'll be them. Um, it would also be an area for they could, they could do the any kind of concrete or unloading of sheetrock or anything like that. Um, but as long as, as long as we enforce the, the, the other I'd say we're going to have more of a problem with the easy and street vehicles than we are with the broad street vehicles. Yeah. And one thing we also came to an agreement, which I think was a very... Uh, big positive is that they have agreed to a to, to pay for a seasonal um, police officer for 12 weeks to monitor that. They're actually going to be assigned to that area um, so that they can help with the traffic flow and any kind of issues that may come up. That they've that was, I believe, the agreement for 12 weeks, um, Great. which will help us through the fall and early winter. 
Don. Can those space and spaces be reopened at night for oh, people they will going be. out it's, to dinner? This is okay. basically just going to be construction parking only during the day. I think we said Until something like six, seven thirty or eight to six o'clock. Okay. Um, so they would be open on the weekends at in the evenings. Um, well, I wouldn't be surprised if they don't have a seven-day work schedule there, but. You know, at least during, yeah. yeah, at least during the day they can. Or a night. lot of their contractors are only here during the week, mm -hmm. so that's why a lot of the weekend work is probably not going to happen. At least people go in the movies and those kind of things will be able to uh, to utilize. It. Okay. And then of course Whalers Lane, we're asking for a portion of the blocking there as well, just because that's going to be new construction um, right. and foundation that's work, actually sheet be a steel. Lot of work. Um, Whalers Lane is potentially going to be closed on that end for two weeks. People will be able to access it from South Beach Street at the end to get into, you know, Vondale and Hunter or the other businesses there. But it'll have to be closed to through traffic yeah. um, for That's portions hard. of time. And again, it, it's it safety it matters and just trying to, you know, yeah. get them in and out. Kay. I think, it, you know, I didn't, in my mind, you know, since it's not a crucial role that, and people can, you know, if they left a point for people to turn around, Make more sense to close a section of it, and they can get their stuff done, and then well open it up sooner. Come on through the what is it? The uh, isn't there an access to the? They can cut through and go into the Harbor House and out that way. Doesn't that mm -hmm. cut through into Whalers, no. or is that the next one over? No, and it doesn't. It doesn't cut That's through, through anymore. I'm thinking, yeah. yeah, there's no cut through anymore. No, they took it out. And one good thing too that came out of the meeting, we. Um, we exchanged, everyone ha is on a list now. Everyone has everybody's contact information, including email addresses and telephone numbers and what organization they work for. And everyone that was at the meeting has all that information. And we've just re been really stressing open communication. Um, and, you know, if somebody's experiencing a problem, let's address it right away. If you, if the NHA knows they're having an event and they would like access to a certain area, let us know. We'll make sure we work with the contractor or that the contractor will work with them. Um, so I think everyone is very, uh, um, you know, open to just making sure that this is a, a good project for the winter and Great. just not that intrusive to everybody. Any other questions? Well, thanks for... Right. Op opening up that so dialogue, Eric. The next item on our well, agenda. are you guys okay with those closings? Can yes. we post them like yes. as of September fifteenth? Yep. Yes. Okay. Next item is committee reports. I'm going to leave that to the end. We're going to go right to town manager's report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The first item is scheduling the date of the 2016 annual town meeting in your packet as a proposed calendar. It's just a proposal. You certainly can set it at whatever date you like. But I know that in the past the board has wanted to try Saturday annual town meetings, and it looks like with various holiday issues not being issues, we could do that potentially on Saturday, April 2nd. That would be the the, the best day, best Saturday for it to proceed on with the election um, a little more than a week later. And then, you know, all the various meetings and other things that lead up to the town meeting are listed on this on this sheet. And so that's all pretty much about the same. Questions? No. My, my recollection is sort of was a lot of people liked it, but not everybody. And, you're, you know, so yeah. you got to make a choice. And if we make a choice, let's just do it. Uh, yeah. Just just a thought on that, Rick. I did I did think about this a little bit, and in an effort to maybe get people more engaged or think about it, um, maybe we could use it as a PR opportunity, and people could go online and vote. You know, you could have like a change petition. You know, change town meeting from a weekday to a Saturday, and people could get engaged. And it's just an idea. You mean in terms of, uh, but I think you, you're not suggesting we not move forward and adopt a date now to get things underway. I mean, is that what, I'm not sure what you're that, saying. That's what I'm suggesting, yeah. Uh, Bob, may I make just a, an offhanded comment as a parent? Um, just check with the school. I think that's the beginning of every sports season, and you might have a great day and find out that every parent would rather be outside watching their kid play softball or baseball. All right. Yeah. Uh, the, I mean, the, the only thing we check with the school on is the availability of the auditorium. I, I think you know what, what Dave said. It, there's all there's that problem, or there's another one. So yeah. you're never going to get everybody. So yeah, it was just a um, something that came up, and I thought it might be fun. But if 
If we want to stick with the system we have, I'm fine with that. I think we should um, check on making some kind of child care available again this year. You know, there was a big effort for it last year, but I don't mm -hmm. know who spearheaded that. It might have had to do with the school on, on the bringing Saturday, forth Dawn? the article. Yeah. But on the Saturday, for there to be something, that they set it up in the cafeteria um, where there were, I think, high school students who weren't yet of age to vote doing a lot of activities with kids. And on a Saturday, that would be perfect. I think there is a group that generally... Let's, uh, let's go with the Saturday. Unless is a, um, you know, I'm fine with that. Yeah. Well, and do, are we going to skip a meeting during school vacation weeks? I know that last year you guys met during school vacation. We probably will, and you just won't be here. <laughs> Don't worry about it. It happens. We'll, we'll take care of all the things you I'm, care about. I'm going to be gone the last week of October, <laughs> so Matt's going to be in charge. You know, oh God. Well, if we need to take a meeting a off, those February, might be good ones so. to pick. <laughs> Especially that yeah. February break because no one's on the island practically. Ooh, that's why it's a great time to meet. <laughs> <laughs> it's usually, uh, we usually don't skip that one because sometimes there's some last minute stuff we have to do for town meeting that needs yeah. approval or this or that. So okay. Anyway, all right, so Libby, let's go with that time schedule of April 2nd, continued on Monday the 4th if need be, and Tuesday the 5th and Wednesday the 6th. Got it. Thank but, you. And we won't, that week, we usually don't have a meeting, right? Correct. So we wouldn't have a scheduled selected meeting on the 6th. Yeah, just just if there's any last-minute town meeting items. And can, I make, can I make a point on the last-minute town meeting stuff? I think it would be nice for the board as well as other committees to keep in mind that unless they are small technical things that come up actually at the last minute it would be nice to keep those things short and concise on the day of town meeting because I did hear from another folks and it wasn't necessarily with the board but it created for a confusing town meeting have other boards meeting right before the meeting and changing the meanings of articles and whatnot so if we yeah. can express that to our other committees I think that would be our community would appreciate that I went to the FinCom meeting and they really echoed that sentiment yeah. in their discussion. Well, okay. Hopefully they'll stand by it. So the right. <laughs> We're just looking for action. <laughs> Your schedule looks good, Libby. Town meeting date. Let's put it in the book. The next item is a request for the town manager to name town authorized representatives for the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection State Revolving Fund Loan Application for the Surfside Wastewater Treatment Facility Improvements Project. Do you have a motion in your packet? It's a requirement that someone in the town be designated to sign these documents for the funding. Oh, and but generally, Libby, we'd love to sign documents. Well, you yeah, I think if we need a motion, I mean, do we have to read it? Is it special? You're supposed to. It's quick. I don't know where it is. But. The Board of Selectmen authorize C. Elizabeth Gibson, town manager, to act as the authorized representative for the town of Nantucket to sign for, accept, and take whatever action is necessary relative to the Surfside Wastewater Treatment Wastewater Treatment Facility Improvements Project and the Massachusetts State Revolving Fund slash Massachusetts Clean Waters Trust. That's the motion. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. There you go, Libby. You're in Thank charge. You. All right. Mr. Rainey, thanks for hanging in there, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. You had nothing else to do tonight, right? Uh, yes, Rob Rainey. Um, I'm your representative of the Steamship Authority. And the steamship can certainly clear a room, can't we? <laughs> um, just want to give you an update. I haven't been before you in a while, so um, just keep you posted on what's going on. Um, traffic numbers to date, uh, numbers are up. Um, July was up um, yeah. by about 10%. August was, was flat over last year, but for the year so far, fast ferry numbers are up about 8%. Um, for passengers, slow slow boats are up about 4%. Total passengers comes in about 6% up. Um, cars are, are relatively flat. We're only up about 350 cars versus last year at this time. Just a question on that. Is that due to, like, capacity? Like, are you operating no. pretty close? Th that's not due to cars. capacity. That's just due to the people coming. Great. 
So uh, we don't know if people are leaving their cars here and just not bringing them because it seemed like there was a lot of traffic. Yeah, we, we used to, the planning used to net them out. We used to net how many over and how many back. I don't know if they still do that. I don't know. Do we, how about trucks? Truck traffic? Trucks, trucks uh, are up, let's see, um, where's my truck number? Trucks are up about 2,000 trucks or about 7% yeah. versus last year at this time. But probably so that most of that is due to construction, the stop and shop, um, you know, the boys club, stuff like that. And fuel being trucked now instead and of barged. Absolutely. Yeah, so if you say 2,000 trucks and 300 cars, you're at 2,300. You know, there's your number. Right. So um, So that's pretty much it for tra uh, traffic. If anybody has questions on that. I just have one. Um, and I, I don't need an answer on this right away. The High Lines <laughs> new boat I was told is going to start running. I knew you were going to ask this. Hopefully Daffodil Weekend of next year. That's what I understand. And then I heard that they're also going to expand their schedule. Have they come? Do they have to come in front of you for that? They do. Um, have they come they've, yet? They've given us a preliminary schedule. At, um, it's not a lot different than their total number of trips that they have now, except it's not going to have the traditional boat. It's going to be all fast boats. And the new boat carries? The new boat, I think it's about 500, although... That's a, even though that's a scary number, about 150 of those seats are outside. So I don't know how that's going to impact. But the old boat right now carries what? It's about 350. And how or many actually, it's about 300. And how many are inside? 200? Two, more than uh, 250. 250 are inside. Now, are they going to take... Is the new boat going to run most of the runs, or is the old boat going to run most I of the I don't runs? have a firm answer on that. I have an indication from them that it's probably going to be the old boat that's going to start off doing most of the trips to work probably out the kinks of the of the new boat. And are they going to, did I, I, did I hear right, are they going to try to run an earlier in the morning boat than they run now? I've not heard that. Um, they are they are somewhat limited by us as to timing, because we don't want their boat leaving or arriving at the same time as ours for the obvious impacts but downtown. yours comes <laughs> offline here pretty soon, your, your high speed. Not until January, January 3rd. Okay. I just, you know, we're just, we're trying to get our head around the infrastructure implications of this yeah. and how we're going to deal with it, so. Yeah, yeah and, and we're awfully, obviously part of the working group for that. There's, a, I guess there's a meeting in October that we're going to be attending, so. I didn't really grasp the capacity of this new boat until I got a glimpse at the plans for the uh, well, yeah. the I, uh, staging. I remember, <laughs> Bobby, going back, it was like a new, instead of the slow boat, we're getting a, just a fast boat. And lack, it, of, it, lack of detail, details let your, lets well, your mind. Well, the boat it is replacing, the, the great point, the great point holds 800. Right. So it, the, the number of people that are coming here on but the High Line are going to be spread out. But the great the point only makes two runs a day. Right, but instead of dropping 800 people at the dock at once. Right. Was so it really doing that ever? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. All yeah. Soon? Every yeah, day. There's two yeah. trips a day. Yeah, 800 people. That's not full, though. It's full on the holidays. It's like yeah. Memorial Day weekend. It's there's full, there's right? quite a few. There are more days than you think that are really? full. Huh. Yeah, really? Wow. Wow. Yeah. It's cheaper. Yeah. But that's right. A few people are flying these days. Everyone's on the boat. And. Sorry, Tom. Go ahead. Oh, I, did I see something about a potential boat that they're proposing from New Bedford that makes a stop off in Oak Bluffs? I'll, I'll get to that in just a second. Okay. Um, so just to uh, continue on here, just so people aren't falling asleep, um, we've got some current projects coming up. We're going to be doing some dolphin repair at the uh, terminal. Um, that's going to involve removing uh, three of the dolphins on the north side which we call slip number one um, replacing those with brand new ones um, and some additional work on the um, slip number two which is the south dock where the fast boat goes uh, that stuff should be done um, we're hoping to get it done before the before December really but we'll see we'll see how that goes um, we are building a new boat also it's a um, I guess the best way to describe it is it's a combination between the Eagle and a freight boat. Um, it looks very similar to the Eagle, except it's slightly smaller in height, but it's got the same general overall dimensions as the Eagle does, um, except the, the last third of it is open to the outside. Well, it doesn't have a roof on it. It's got walls. 
um, that boat is going to have about the capacity that the Eagle does. And it's going to probably, it's being constructed right now. Um, it's, it's due to be completed at the end of April 2016, start the summer season probably on the vineyard route at this point, and we'll see it uh, next fall, in the fall of 16, for at least a month or so to fill in. Um, that also gives us the opportunity to have a boat in case we have a breakdown to fill in. We're, we're stretched very thin right now, as everybody knows. Um, we've been very lucky with, uh, with not having any major mechanical issues or breakdowns, especially during the height of the summer. Um, so this will give us some flexibility as far as that goes because it's going to be interchangeable between the two islands. Is it quicker? Marginally. The the problem with going quicker is we're sort of at the, it's fuel. And, you know, right now fuel is cheap, which sounds great, but if we commit to going faster and burning more fuel, fuel is going to come back up and, you know, the same old story. You've got to push that water out of the way, and there's a lot of water to it's, push. It's amazing how much one knot in speed burns more fuel. Um, we are uh, in the process of rebuilding the Woods Hole terminal. I don't. Most people don't go to Woods Hole anymore. I've been there quite a few times in the last couple of years. It's it hasn't changed at all, really. In the last 50 years, it looks exactly the same. We're going to change that. Um, it needs to be updated. It needs to come up to current codes. It's a very complicated thing. Um, we're running up against a little bit of resistance from the Woods Hole community as far as. Um, trying to control traffic in and out of the terminal um, and the perception that by rebuilding the terminal we're going to be increasing the number of trips to the vineyard and it's it's a it leads into the New Bedford discussion um, the Woods Hole and Falmouth people would like very much to push a lot of the traffic out of Woods Hole over to New Bedford and run from New Bedford or have the steamship run from New Bedford to uh, the vineyard and potentially on to Nantucket. There is a company that uh, right now it's called Sea Streak. It runs um, from New Bedford to Oak Bluffs at the moment and it's been doing that for a few years and they have a proposal in front of us. Um, it's, it's tentative because they're trying to work with Highline but they have a proposal to go from New Bedford to Oak Bluffs and then on to Nantucket. Um, maybe once or twice a day. They're not sure. Yes, and then go back. Um, the hope, my hope, is that by doing that and with um, cooperation from Highline, there will be an increased um, frequency of inner island travel, which right now, if you try to take a boat from here to the vineyard, it's you can do it one way, but you can't do a day trip. You can't go over and back in the same day. So it's, it's a very complicated thing. It looks very simple. The problem is that the vineyard from here is slightly farther than it is from here to Hyannis. So jogging all these pieces together is, is pretty complicated, but there will be public meetings um, if, that, if it comes to us granting a license for that, so the public will have input. Can I, can I just add in that I think it's, I would encourage you um, to get this boat to run between the islands. I think it's something that is important for both of us growing as economies in the future inter-island. After, uh, after this proposal came forward, Highline, who has been trying to figure out the inter-island service for some, they used to do it a little over 10 years ago. They had slow boats that did it. It was a two-hour trip, two-hour plus trip, and they did two or three of them a day. And you could go over, even though it was a slow boat, you could go over from here, spend the day on the vineyard, and come back in one day. Um, they stopped that because they their boats got allocated to other routes. They it just they concentrated on fast boats, and so they they lost that. And now they're doing this one trip thing. The New Bedford proposal has forced them to come up with a sort of a competition type of thing with, against these New Bedford people to increase their inner island stuff. So that that's a benefit from this. Um, we don't have any concrete proposals yet, but um, that's hopefully going to happen. Great. Um, going forward, uh, I don't know if anyone's been on the boat recently. Wi-Fi has improved quite a bit. Um, we are constantly testing it. There are testers that go on the boat with computers to make sure that the signal and everything is working. Um, 
when we get complaints about it, there are people that address them almost immediately. We'll talk to contact the customer, talk to them, see what their issue is. Oftentimes, it's the consumer's device that is the problem, not our Wi-Fi. It's a connectivity thing. Sometimes it's set wrong, or you know, it's very technical. But it, it, we've we are improving that. Um, electronic ticketing. We are moving towards a system where. You can either have a ticket that you've printed at home or uh, a copy of it on your smartphone where you can scan it in without giving it to somebody standing there and continue on to the boat. Um, that again is, it sounds easier than it is because these machines have to be all weather. They, we have, and they're still testing it, but it developed a problem being outside because it, it was too bright outside to read the smartphone. And it's, it's just, it's, it's complicated, but we're moving in that direction just to make the experience, the steamship experience more 21st century than we already are. Um, we also do, you can sign up on the website for email and text alerts for our waitlist program. The waitlist program, if anyone doesn't know what that is, you, if you cannot get the reservation that you want, you can book a reservation for a later date and go on the waitlist for certain trips that you would like to go instead that aren't available. When those become available, the computer system automatically slots you into that spot that you want and then will notify you with an email and a text alert that you got your spot. And that, that waitlist system has, has really uh, been very good. And we've, we've had a lot of people that were surprised that the steamship could just do that, and we do. So that's good. Um, next spring, because of, of the demand issues that we had this past spring, we're going to be starting our spring schedule a month earlier than we did this past year. That, will, that includes um, extra freight boat trips, and it it, uh, it seems to be that, um, well, certainly last year, a lot of the demand that we had was from uh, contractor landscapers and stuff that couldn't get their trucks and vehicles over to jump into the spring season. Um, and so we had a lot of backup from that, and we we're addressing that. Um, we already sort of touched on the great point, which is the High Line's traditional boat. Um, which they're going to, they've committed to not running next summer and they're going to be all, um, all fast boats. So we, we don't know exactly what the impact of that is going to be. Um, certainly here at the dock, they have to, um, to accommodate their new boat, they're going to have to do some improvements on the dock as far as ramps and, and access uh, equipment. And it's probably, it's, uh, from a from you know a traffic standpoint, it's going to spread people out a little bit because you're not dumping as many people at once. It's going to spread out over the over the course of the day, but we you know we don't know how it's going to impact the steamship. We don't, and Highline doesn't fully understand how it's going to impact them because they don't know. There are people that they specifically take the traditional boat because of cost. And they, they're not sure what's going to happen when they're faced with a choice of either taking a fast boat or taking a fast boat. So we'll see. Hmm. Um, we, we do constantly evaluate uh, traffic at the terminal. Um, we recognize that we, and we have made some scheduling improvements that have improved the flow. Um, but there are still issues that we can, with the help of, of the town and, and traffic advisors um, maybe improve. Um, it's certainly with the, the wave bus. The wave bus has been, the park and ride has been has been very good. Uh, I'm not happy with where it parks at the terminal. It doesn't really work with the flow, but we're, we're working with Paula and we're trying to figure that out. Um, we also, that sort of dovetails into Lower Broad Street, um, which is is an area of the island that everybody sort of goes by, looks at, and it's sort of accepted that it looks like hell. And w the steamship would, you know, benefit obviously from helping cleaning that up and maybe keeping, you know, the trucks sort of screened from uh, the strip there. And it could be, a, it would certainly be a safety um, improvement and security as well. 
So that brings, uh, we have a board meeting here in September. We have um, one on Nantucket uh, twice a year, usually in June and September. So everyone's invited to our September meeting. It's um, at the NHA um, on Broad Street. And we also are gonna have this Saturday at the Elder Expo, we're gonna have a table, um, a steamship table for people there. And with that, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to. Pardon my ignorance, but what is a dolphin? A dolphin is the, it's the big uh, cement uh, things that are out there that sort of keep the boat on track as it's docking. Got it. Sometimes, yeah. sometimes they get hit and over, over the course of the years, they get bent and sort of knocked yeah. out of place and. Just never, never, never heard that before. Thank they, you. they haven't. I don't think they've been addressed in some time. So we've been pretty good. But the north side. That's right. Yeah, yeah. The south side seems to be fine. Just move the boat over the south side. Yes. Yeah. It'll probably have to. Well, we're not sure yet, but it'll probably have to spend the night on the south side and then, you know, leave in the morning. So. Any Thank you. Awesome. We'll see you in October. Yes. Okay. Um, that takes care of town manager's report. Let's go back to committee reports. Is there any committees that need to be? Anybody have any committee reports? I I I do not, but I can say that the um, Affordable Housing Trust Fund is going to meet on the 14th, and we now have a full committee, and we're excited to start grappling with some of these housing issues. Um, we have a bit of financing to work with to engage in studies and we would love to work with the board in any way to expedite the process going into town meeting because we are aware that the board is focused on a lot of other things and it is uh, challenging for the board to, of selectmen to deal with so many issues and um, we're at your disposal. And it's a very good group of people. <coughs> Anybody else? Nope. Late summer, a lot of people, uh, you know, off and about, Bobby. So, um, meeting schedule, just so everyone knows, we have a meeting in two weeks, right, which is the 23rd, and then we'll resume our weekly schedule in October. October 7th, yeah. Right. And we'll pro we're going to do executive session on Thursday. The gotcha. Okay. We'll go back to the morning. To the, are you going back to the morning on Thursday? Or? I think we'll go back to the morning to start. But See how just okay. Or would you prefer a 4 o'clock? I would prefer a 4 o'clock. Mm -hmm. Just I because it's, it's tough to take off on Wednesday and then um, do so a morning so off on Thursday. So you're suggesting Thursday afternoon at yeah, 4? Yeah, yeah. If that, if okay that time didn't work that earlier work well or later, it would be fine. But it doesn't work well. She's got kids. Uh, when when FinCom starts, that's going to tend to be problematic. Right. On the eighth at four o'clock, there's a housing forum at the yacht club. So here's the other. Let me throw this out there since we're trying to grapple with this through the winter months. Since we have Wednesday meetings. Oh, well, since we have Wednesday meetings, has I'm going to throw out the idea of having our executive session Wednesday at at one. Or noon, or is that going to screw you up for the day? If we're already meeting Wednesday night, why don't we do our executive session the same day, and then Tobias only has well, to take one day off? And do you do you want to just do it later, like four or five? Four or five. Yeah. We just, well, just five but what about FinCom on Wednesdays? Will that screw you up? No, because they typically don't meet Wednesdays. So why don't we meet Wednesday at four, yeah, and we can do it upstairs here, and great. then we can come right downstairs. Just. Just a thought, it's maybe. Four o'clock is not good for me. Well, it's gonna one day a month. You're gonna have to make arrangements because we, otherwise we, have to. Does five work better? Yeah. But but, but the problem is, is, okay, we can do it at five, but we're gonna be doing a lot of nights. We're gonna be going back into executive session like we are now because you can't get it done in one hour. Yeah. What's the what was the problem with uh, Thursdays? Was it what at nine a.m.? Well, then I have to take time off from work, and he has to take time off from work. Okay. I was so just going to say we could do it, it at eight. Just, I could do it and at eight. And come scallop season, I won't be scalloping probably, but yeah, I, I don't care how a lot of scallops out there, Bobby. Well, there's a lot more than you think. I, I went diving. I went diving too. <laughs> you didn't dive where I dove. Uh oh, we got to converse then. <laughs> um, all right, so let's. Yeah, I, look, I'm indifferent. So. Uh, all right, well, let's just uh, let's let's do October 
th Wednesday at 5 on the same day. And if we need to go into executive session and get after our meeting, we will. And if we start finding it to be problematic, we'll either have to bump up the we time or, because, or know, do it during the day on Wednesday. Coming back later is not good thought process. No. We're all tired. We're the other tired. option is that we, we do executive session Wednesday mornings, and then we do regular selectman meetings Wednesday nights. Yes. So, so. Um, I'm fine with that, the Wednesday morning and Wednesday nights. I think that's better than trying to cram it all in in one night. I don't know what. That, that's fine for me, and I can do it as early as 8. Ooh, what would you prefer? Because I know it screws up your whole day when you have a middle of the day. Well, meeting. the the trouble with Wednesdays at eight is that in October, November, and most of December, or part of December, the capital program committee meeting is going right. to it's right. going to be meeting at eight. Well, could we do? No, they could change too. So we can. Ch we could. Well, well we could just go back to our ten group. to twelve, yeah. like we've always ten to eleven, and if we have to go longer, we go longer, and just meet Wednesday at ten or eleven, just so we don't. Libby and I aren't running from Capitol. What time does Capitol usually meet? 8 to 10, 10.30. So would you like to do... I, I've already... I mean, I, I have... Um, not, not that I matter, but I do have Wednesday mornings, All right. 9 o'clock and 10 o'clock. Let's standings. do this. Let's do, when, let's do the, the Wednesday, the... Was it 7th of October? Wednesday the 7th, yeah. Let's do it at 5. We'll see how we do. And then we'll figure out November, and maybe we we meet at two o'clock or noon or one or after lunch or something like that. But it gives us time to think about what works best for us. I would I just would appreciate the Wednesday. I like that, Bobby. All, all well, I, I agree. I mean, we could, I, we could it's try much easier to take one day and just do everything. So but does that does four thirty work for you or no? Well, it's I'll, the kids I'll see are what I can figure out. That's just that like window between like three and five can be a little problematic because of okay. its its activities. But yeah, okay. Well, luckily does, it's does one day a month and not every week. Yeah, it's so. one it's one day a month. So okay. I can, later is better if we have time. But we'll all right, I'll so it out. I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Is there a second? Okay. All right. And now we need to go back upstairs. So, the 7th at 5.